Today, I am deeply honored to welcome Vice President Al Gore. He joins us to discuss his latest book, Our Choice, A Plan to Solve the Climate Crisis. In Mr. Gore's new book, we find exactly that, a plan. The book provides direct ideas, a collection of tangible solutions from personal to global to change what is happening to our planet. The book has been called authoritative, exhaustive, reasoned, erudite, and logical. And renowned environmentalist Bill McKibben explains our choice is, quote, the grand compendium of all that we know about how to undertake this most difficult of transitions, from an economy that burns fossil fuels to an economy that lives mostly on the incoming power of the sun in its many forms. Mr. Gore has created yet again an accessible and urgent vehicle of information that demands decisions and actions. For over 30 years, Al Gore has been the leading advocate for confronting the threat of global warming. His efforts were outlined in the best-selling book, Earth in the Balance. Mr. Gore, is, Mr. Gore is also the author of An Inconvenient Truth, the best-selling book and subject of the Academy Award-winning documentary of the same title, which I believe a few of you may have seen. Al Gore is a graduate of Harvard University and the co-founder and chairman of Current TV, an Emmy Award-winning, independently-owned cable and satellite news network. He is co-founder and chairman of Generation Investment Management, a firm focused on a new approach to sustainable investing. Mr. Gore is a member of the board of directors of Apple and a senior advisor to Google. He is a visiting professor at Middle Tennessee State University and chairs the Alliance for Climate Protection, the nonprofit organization designated to, solve, to help solve the climate crisis. As you all know, Mr. Gore has served in the U.S. House of Representatives and the United States Senate and was inaugurated as the 45th Vice President of the United States in 1993. He is a recipient of both a 2005 Webby Award and a co-recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, thank you for joining us tonight. Please join me in welcoming Vice President Al Gore. Thank you very much for that very warm and generous welcome. It's great to be back in Cambridge. Thank you, Heather Gain, for the very generous introduction. Uh, the Harvard Bookstore is one of my favorite in the whole world. Uh, there are lots of good friends here, and I'm not going to try to acknowledge uh, everybody, but I want to acknowledge Bob and Ann Massey, uh, who I'm told are here somewhere. There you go. And uh, Bob has been one of the great leaders in the movement to get uh, accountability um, among uh, large institutions and financial institutions. And uh, I'm very grateful for, for your work, Bob. My friend Ann Peretz uh, uh, is, is here. And uh, thank you. One of my teachers. Uh, she, she hated it when I called her ma'am the first time I met her because she was <laughs> only a couple years older than, than me. Uh, Jim McCarthy, one of the IPCC leaders, uh, co-recipient uh, as a member of the IPCC of the Nobel Peace Prize and, and many others. And I don't have my glasses on, so I, if I look right at you and don't recognize you, that's the reason. Uh, <laughs> It's great to be here. My own personal journey on the um, issue of the climate crisis began here in Cambridge 42 years ago when I walked into the classroom of Roger Revell, and he was a, a genius and a, a great man, a distinguished scientist. He was the first to propose the epic uh, long-running 50-year-plus uh, measurement of CO2 in the Earth's atmosphere, uh, one of the most important scientific uh, undertakings uh, in, in the history of human civilization. And uh, during his course, uh, he opened my eyes to what this was all about and uh, opened a window onto the future through which it was possible to, to see what would unfold if we did not uh, take action to halt the rapidly accumulating uh, global warming pollution in the Earth's uh, atmosphere. So it is a homecoming for me uh, each time I come back to this, to this, to this city. Um, I want to acknowledge here in Massachusetts the outstanding uh, leadership of Ed Markey and John Kerry, 
Uh, Ed, uh, along with his colleague Henry Waxman, did a, a terrific job in a very difficult political environment in the House of Representatives to get legislation that, uh, while uh, containing uh, provisions that uh, many of us would not have wanted to see, and Ed didn't either, nevertheless uh, walked a line between what was uh, possible politically and what is necessary to respond to the crisis. And John Kerry has been the preeminent leader in the United States Senate in pulling together the various groups and factions to get legislation there. And that uh, effort is proceeding. Uh, Barbara Boxer, uh, his colleague, just reported out of the Environment Committee this week one of the uh, six pieces of the legislation that will all be combined together in a consensus draft uh, due to be uh, available before Copenhagen and designed to attract the, vo the votes of 60 senators, a sufficient number to, uh, to pass the legislation in the aftermath of Copenhagen. Uh, I was on the phone this morning with the Prime Minister of Denmark. Uh, he gave uh, an update of the preparations there. And uh, I think that in spite of the odds and in spite of the pessimism, there is an excellent uh, chance of a binding political agreement among heads of state in Copenhagen that will uh, both begin immediate implementation uh, of reductions and give a roadmap to the negotiators who will be assigned to complete the details of a comprehensive uh, treaty in the months following Copenhagen. Uh, seems like a long time since uh, I've been, since I started working on this issue, and I was reminded uh, of that not long ago when. I was with a friend in Los Angeles, and we worked through lunch and headed back out uh, toward the Los Angeles airport and stopped for a quick bite at a place called Soup and Sandwich. And we walked through the line. I got a bowl of soup, sat down at a plastic table on a plastic chair. Uh, and as I was uh, beginning to eat my soup, this woman walked by in front of the table, just staring at me as she walked by. And I didn't think too much about that until a few moments later, out of the corner of my eye, I saw the same woman coming from the opposite direction, <laughs> just staring. And so to be polite, I looked up and I said, how do you do? And she took a step forward and she said, you know, if you dyed your hair black, <laughs> you, you would look just like Al Gore. <laughs> I said, thank you so much. And <laughs> she said, you sound like him, too. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm really happy to have completed this book. It, uh, it has been uh, the most difficult for me because it covers so much territory. And in order to do it justice, I found it necessary to drill down very deeply into a variety of different subjects, all of which are connected uh, intimately to any comprehensive plan to solve the climate crisis. The process uh, with which, in, in which I wrote, uh, researched and wrote the book included more than 30 so-called solution summits uh, to which I invited the leading world experts on each of the topics explored in the book. And they were generous with their time and patient with my request to go back over the material slowly and uh, please put it in language I can understand uh, because that's the only way I can communicate it to others. And in a real sense, the, 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 this book represents the the, the insights of these uh, hundreds of experts, they're all listed in the back of the book in the acknowledgments, and I, I want to acknowledge my debt of gratitude uh, to them. These sessions were very exciting uh, because many of the experts sitting around uh, 
the table with their peers and colleagues got into very heated discussions of elements that uh, they didn't always uh, agree on, but often uh, these discussions yielded some, some new insights that they felt were of value to them, notwithstanding all of the years of study and dedication they put into these topics. And every time that happened, I, I, it gave me a good feeling because I thought I was getting uh, the very best that they had to offer. Unlike uh, An Inconvenient Truth, which focused uh, about 85 percent uh, on the causes and the impacts and um, uh, the uh, nature of the crisis and 15 percent on the solutions, this is about 99 percent uh, on the solutions themselves. When I was uh, completing the outline for the book, it turned out to be a 40-page uh, single-spaced outline, and uh, I knew I was in trouble when I <laughs> finished that exercise. But even though it's all about solutions, I wanted to include an update on the impacts because so many new discoveries have come out uh, since uh, during, during the last three and a half years. Uh, they come out almost uh, every week now. The growing acidification of the oceans that is interrupting the process by which anything that makes a shell or uh, a reef uh, scavenges calcium carbonate to make those hard structures. The, the, we're putting 90 million tons of CO2 into the thin shell of atmosphere surrounding our planet every 24 hours. And more than 25 million of those tons every day go into the oceans. And uh, they, they become uh, carbonic acid that is now present in such amounts that evenly distributed uh, pretty much that it, it has actually changed the acidity level of the oceans. Uh, overall, the pattern that has been clear to scientists like Jim and others who've lived with this for such a long time is by now a familiar pattern. The IPCC uh, typically projects uh, uh, different scenarios of where the crisis is going, a low, medium, high, and then a few years later they go back and examine the evidence, and in almost every case, the actual impacts turn out to be uh, right at or even above the worst case projection that had been compiled only a few years prior to that. It is a challenge to our moral imagination to get our arms around the, the magnitude and scale of this crisis. It is uh, absolutely staggering. Uh, in any case, um, I ended up writing uh, 17 single-spaced uh, pages on the impacts, on the updated impacts, and it didn't, even, didn't fit anywhere. So I saved it for the, that's what I, was, that's what I thought. And, and so I, uh, I saved them for the introduction. And uh, they, they didn't fit in the introduction, at least that, that's what my editor said. And uh, I said, well, I'll compress them to make them, uh, uh, to make it shorter. And I got it down to 12 pages. <laughs> and it still didn't fit. And so I brutally compressed more and got them down to five pages. And they still didn't fit. So I kept on uh, compressing. And at the end of that process, I ended up just writing one line about uh, each, of the, uh, each of the impacts. And I put, I put them at the end of the uh, introduction, and I'll just uh, start with this. I, I'm, I'm not a poet, but this is, what, uh, this is how that process ended up. One thin September soon, a floating continent disappears in midnight sun. Vapors rise as fever settles on an acid sea. Neptune's bones dissolve. Snow glides from the mountain. 
Ice fathers floods for a season. A hard rain comes quickly. Then dirt is parched. Kindling is placed in the forest for the lightning celebration. Unknown creatures take their leave unmourned. Horsemen ready their stirrups. Passion seeks heroes and friends. The bell of the city on the hill is rung. The shepherd cries, the hour of choosing has arrived. Here are your tools. That's at the conclusion of an introduction that's one bookend along with the, the conclusion itself. And the conclusion sketches out two scenarios. Letters to the future, imagining our response in the event that we failed to meet this challenge, how would we respond? And the second scenario, if we succeed, as we must, how can we describe that success and how it came about? In between those two bookends uh, are chapters that explore First of all, in, in the first section clearly describes the nature of the causes of the problem. And what it all comes down to uh, are six molecules. And the six gases, one of them's technically not a gas, but the six gases that cause the climate crisis. And of course, CO2 is the principal one, uh, by far the largest part of the cause. But recent uh, scientific advances have taken into account the complicated uh, interaction of these uh, six kinds of molecules in the atmosphere and with other chemicals and with aerosols. Uh, and that results in a recalibration of the relative importance of each of the, of the six. Uh, when I wrote An Inconvenient Truth, uh, just because I'm a geek wannabe, uh, I was happy uh, to get some uh, cutting edge science that had been through the peer review process but had not been published yet. That's really a sweet spot that you want to aim for in this line of work. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy that uh, once again that was uh, possible uh, due to the generosity of uh, some scientists at uh, NASA who have uh, uh, been on the cutting edge of, of this uh, science for quite some time, uh, a group uh, in this case led by a scientist uh, named Dr. Drew Shendell. And it was just published uh, three days before the book was published in Science Magazine, but it didn't make it through the peer review process until the final day of the, <laughs> of the deadline for the book to go on the, on the press. So I was sweating that. I'm waiting, waiting it, waiting it out. I probably would have used it anyway, uh, but because I, 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 I had confidence that it would get approved. But there, um, there are on page uh, 46, new fig, uh, 47, new figures that uh, do represent what I, uh, I regard as the cutting edge scientific uh, estimate of exactly what the contribution uh, of these six. Uh, greenhouse uh, ga gre global warming pollutants uh, um, are. And there's one new element added to the list, not even mentioned as a cause in the last IPCC report, not because they don't understand it fully, of course they do, but black carbon, also called soot, uh, was not put into the same category because it has different characteristics. It only stays in the atmosphere for a few days or a week. Uh, and it doesn't trap outgoing infrared. It traps incoming sunlight. But it's a double threat because it not only uh, retains heat in the atmosphere, but it also settles on the surface of the ice and snow in places like the Himalayas and the Arctic, darkening the surface of the snow and ice 
and making it uh, so that it absorbs much more of the incoming solar radiation, thus accelerating the melting rate. A comprehensive plan like the one described in this book really needs to focus first of all on CO2, but also on the other five. And some of the other five give us a chance to get reductions quickly and buy some much needed time to implement the, the more difficult uh, changes that are necessary to back uh, CO2 emissions uh, out of our pattern of civilization. We face uh, what you could call a carbon crisis because the climate crisis is connected to the security crisis. We have had several wars in the Middle East, all of them with uh, complicated causes, but one enduring cause for our involvement in that region is the very real fact that America's national security is at risk when global oil markets are so vulnerable to sudden and drastic disruption. Elsewhere in the book, I have a, a, a graphic of what's happened to oil prices in uh, the last 39 years, uh, during which we've had OPEC embargoes and hostage crises and uh, all the rest. And the impact on the U.S. economy when oil prices shoot way up is very harsh indeed. But the energy security crisis has to be addressed not just in the moment of high oil prices, but during the times when prices come back down. And we've followed a pattern that uh, President Barack Obama described I think better uh, than I've heard it elsewhere, uh, we go from shock to trance. When the prices go up, we're in a state of shock and they come back down and we fall back into a kind of trance state, if you will. And it's important for us as Americans to understand that the nature of the world oil market is not just an oligopoly, it is partly a free market, it's a hybrid. But when supply and demand are in sufficient balance to allow the manipulation of supply and therefore price, uh, it can be done by the sovereign states in the Middle East that own the largest reserves of oil and have the ability to go up or down in their daily production rate and have a very profound impact on the global price. And we've wrongly assumed that they followed one strategic objective, and that is to maximize their price at any, max, maximize their revenue at any given time. And of course they do, but they think strategically. And that has led them to pursue two goals, not one. They want to get the maximum revenue, but when they sense the formation of political will sufficient to develop alternatives to foreign oil, then they will bring the price back down and disrupt the forward planning of governments and businesses uh, who have mobilized uh, during their time of shock to develop renewables and to develop substitutes for foreign oil. So it's connected to the energy security crisis. It is also, of course, connected to our economic crisis because we are sending so many hundreds of billions of dollars every single year to foreign producers of oil. It puts our current account deficit in a, in a, a, a totally new category. And in order to restore the integrity of our finances, we have to find a way to reduce the dependence uh, on these carbon-based fuels. And continuing uh, the uh, 
description of how this is connected to the economy, the biggest and best source of good new jobs in the United States is by putting millions of people to work, retrofitting homes and businesses, developing and installing solar energy and wind power and geothermal power and uh, building a super grid, a, a network of smart grids with smart storage and low losses from the lines that transmit and distribute electricity, uh, shifting over to electric cars uh, that can run on that renewable energy brought from remote areas like the southwestern desert where the sun is so intense and the mountain corridor where the wind blows so uh, powerfully uh, and from the, the best of the enhanced uh, geothermal power sites. So there is a common thread running through the climate, security, and economic crises. And that common thread is our ridiculous and absurd overdependence on oil, coal, and other carbon-based fuels. If we grab hold of that thread and pull it hard, all three of these crises begin to unravel, and we hold in our hands the answer to all of them. A generational one-off shift away from fuels that are dirty, dangerous, expensive, and vulnerable to a source of fuel that is free forever. The technologies that are necessary to make use of those free fuels, the sun and the wind and the natural heat of the earth, cost money. But once we shift, then the incremental fuel cost year, uh, for every year after that is indeed free. Enough sunlight falls on the surface of this planet every hour to equal the entire world's total energy use for a full year. And the efficiency with which the engineers uh, and, and, and developers have been able to capture and convert the heat and the photons from the sunlight into usable electricity has been improving dramatically. And to some extent, the plan contained in this depends upon not just attacking these solutions separately in an isolated way, but in anticipating the convergence of several initiatives that create a gestalt, that work together and give us a completely new uh, set of opportunities. I mentioned one of them before, installing uh, solar facilities in the desert and wind in the mountains, building a smart super grid that connects those areas to the cities and replacing automobiles over time with the internal combustion engine, horribly inefficient, with electric, plug-in electrics and all electrics, using that as what you might call a widely distributed national battery. We think of a battery as a uh, as one thing, if it's broken up into lots of small pieces, all of them connected by smart wires, still a battery. It's just widely distributed. Uh, those three elements together represent one of the several examples of how by attacking this crisis on multiple fronts simultaneously and anticipating how the elements of the solution fit together, we can solve this crisis. Indeed, the most important learning experience that I had personally going through this work was the realization that when you put them all together, we really do have enough tools and technologies to solve three or four climate crises. And the good news is we only have to solve one. But the missing element still is political will. And so to that list of crises that I've mentioned, let me add one more. We have a democracy crisis. Our democracy in America is not working as our founders intended and hoped that it would. Two years ago, I wrote a book called The Assault on Reason that is focused on the, the causes of, of that 
interruption to the uh, intended workings uh, of our democracy. And I'm not going to go back uh, through the case that I laid out in that book, but briefly stated the shift from the printing press to television as the dominant means of communication through which the conversation of democracy is carried today has had a profound impact. First of all, it is a one-way communication. The average American now watches television five hours per day, which translates in an average American lifespan to 17 uninterrupted years watching television. And somebody's making up for me and some of the rest of you <laughs> to, 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 to bring up that average. But it has other, and, and so it, it, it induces a, a kind of political lethargy. And those with special agendas uh, in our country make good use of that box that has entranced so many millions uh, of Americans for so many hours a day with messages that are intended to shape the political consciousness of our country such as it is. Uh, and it has another, of, well, let me put it this way. If you played tennis for five hours a day every day, or you went running for five hours a day, you would develop some tremendous muscles as a result. If you watch television five hours a day every day, what muscles are you developing? Not the democracy muscle. <laughs> now, the, the, the other impact is, since this is by far the dominant means of communication, in spite of the oncoming internet, and I'll get to that in a moment. Because of that, 80% of the campaign budgets for both Democrats and Republicans are now devoted to buying 30-second television ads. And the overall expense of campaigns has gone up dramatically as a result. So from the day they're sworn into office, our elected officials know that they have to go out and, and raise six, seven, eight, ten thousand dollars every single day during that term in office, and then start up and do it all over again. Now, where do you suppose they could go to get that much money every year, year after year? Well, they go to, to corporate PACs and to special interests that take various forms, no matter what the campaign finance reform laws uh, are, the new, new ways around them emerge, but there are special interests that set aside enormous amounts of money every year specifically for the purpose of feeding the political system. And it used to be a graceful wink and a nod, it's more than that now. I'm not talking about corruption, not at all, but I'm talking about a serious deformation of American democracy. And right now, we've been having a vivid illustration of the net result. When these special interests want to stop reform movements in the Congress, they have an enormous and unhealthy amount of power to do so. We are in an age of transition. I mentioned the internet. It's not an accident that most all of the great reform movements in the world are now based on the internet because it recapitulates the architecture of the printing press in one important respect. It has low entry barriers for individuals. And the ideas and other contributions of individuals rise or fall according to the estimation uh, of the collective participants in that dialogue. And as a result, the growth 
of the internet as a potential challenger to the dominant medium of television brings with it a source of great hope that we will be able to reclaim control of our destiny and fulfill the dream of self-government of the people, by the people, and for the people. The Alliance for Climate Protection, uh, which Heather mentioned, is the recipient of all of the proceeds that uh, I would otherwise get from this book, um, has a website that I want to mention to you, and I want to invite you to, to, to go to it. It's called repoweramerica.org, repoweramerica.org. You'll find a video wall on that site. I'd like to ask you to put up a, a short little video from that little camera on your computer screen, on your laptop, and, and, and add your voice to the, the many thousands that are already saying, look, this is coming from the people. The most important reform movements in our history have arisen from the grassroots. Large reforms by nature arouse the ire and resistance of powerful entities that see themselves as benefiting from the old way of doing things. And in this present political culture, as I've just described it, th the ability of these legacy uh, centers of power to stop change is enhanced, making it all the more important for men and women and young people all over our country to, to get active and to speak up. It's important to change the light bulbs and the windows, but it's a lot more important to change the laws and the policies. And the only way we can do that, facing such massive self-interested resistance, is to, is to share with one another the, the, the ideas, the convictions, and the passion that we owe to this cause. We've never faced a problem like this before, ever. Because as most of you know, what's happened is the entire relationship between humankind and the Earth's ecological system has been radically transformed in less than 100 years. Population has quadrupled in 100 years. And by the time it stabilizes uh, in, in or on or about 2050, it will be five and a half times as many people as lived on this planet in 1900. Now, this is a success story in slow motion, and there is a, a, a chapter on population that represents the newest cutting edge uh, social science that gives confidence that this transition toward population stability is in fact emerging. Every country in the world is somewhere along the path that marks the transition from one state of equilibrium to another, the first being high death rates, high birth rates, and large families. And the second equilibrium in which the United States, Western Europe, Japan already uh, are living is low death rates, low birth rates, and small families. But importantly, developing countries all around the world are also traveling that path. And they know now, as this chapter points out, there are four conditions that have to be present in a society to induce that transformation in the pattern of the population dynamic. First, the education of girls. Second, the empowerment of women to take part in the decisions of their societies, families, and communities. Third, the available means for managing fertility and allowing women to choose how many children they're going to have and what the spacing of those children will be. And fourth, most importantly, higher child survival rates because parents with the confidence that their children will live naturally prefer smaller families and have throughout history provided women are equal and girls are educated and the means for managing fertility in culturally acceptable ways country by country are present. And so long as the child survival rates are very high. 
So that's a success story in slow motion. Nevertheless, it ha this huge increase in population is one of the principal factors that has redefined our relationship to the planet. The second factor is much more important and much more powerful, and that is the technologies that are in common use around the world uh, are m a million times more powerful than the ones our grandparents had available to them. And you don't have to focus on the dramatic examples like uh, nuclear weapons or genetic engineering, but think about chemical processing and the incredibly powerful new chemical compounds, thousands of which are uh, introduced every day, very few of which are really tested for their uh, impact. Uh, and you can go right down the list. Every tool and every technology that we use is infinitely more powerful than the ones that used to be commonly used. And as a result, we are having a very powerful impact on the Earth. And of course, again, the most vulnerable part of the Earth system is that astonishingly thin shell of atmosphere surrounding the planet. 150 years ago this year, two events took place the same year that are crucial to the evolution of this crisis. First, Colonel Edwin Drake drilled the first oil well in the world in Pennsylvania. He wasn't really a colonel, but that's another story. <laughs> the same year, the great Irish scientist John Tyndall discovered that CO2 molecules intercept and trap infrared radiation or, or heat. And so the birth of the oil age and the birth of climate science really uh, had the same uh, birth year. We had already started using coal. And coal and oil together represent the single largest part of this crisis. But there are multiple other factors industrial uh, feedlots, industrial farming, the way we are strip mining the soils of the earth, the Faustian bargain that we have struck with synthetic ammonia fertilizers, which now feed 95% plus of the agriculture on our planet. These processes pull carbon out of the soil. And many are not aware that the carbon in the soil, in the topsoil of the earth, is three to four and a half times the volume of all the carbon in the trees and the vegetation. Now, deforestation is now responsible for roughly 20% of the CO2 that's being released into the atmosphere uh, every day. So I, people are coming to grips with the fact that an international agreement to reduce industrial emissions also has to reduce the rampant burning and destruction of forest lands. But there is not yet as wide and broad an appreciation of the fact that in order to solve this, we also have to pay attention to what's happening to the soils. Because when carbon is taken out of the soil, incidentally, uh, anybody ever spend time on a, on a farm here, a few? How do you recognize uh, the best soil? What does it look like? It's, it's black. Why is it black? That's the carbon. 58% of the humus layer of the, of the soil is pure organic carbon. And plowing in the old way uh, and synthetic fertilizers and the lack of crop rotation and poor farming practices aimed at maximizing in the short term the yields without uh, giving a thought to how fertile the soils will be the following year. This has put an enormous amount of CO2 into the uh, atmosphere. Now don't get me wrong, industrial emissions uh, are still by far the largest source, but if we're going to solve this, we're going to have to really get serious about taking on every single component of it. So there's a chapter in here on, on soil and agriculture. 
and the changes that can be made. And once again, the interconnections are important because by recarbonizing the soil, putting the black back in the soil, we can increase food security, make the land more fertile, provide new sources of income for subsistence farmers. These are important objectives in and of themselves, but they are also collateral benefits of an intelligent plan to, to, to reduce the amount of global warming pollution going up into the atmosphere and increase the amount being pulled back down. So the first section outlines the precise nature of the causes and what the implications are for constructing solutions. The second <clears throat> chapter in that first part deals with energy, where our energy comes from and where it goes. How much of it is liquid fuels, gaseous fuels, uh, hard fuels like uh, coal, uh, et, et, et cetera. What the processing of it uh, is all about and how that contributes uh, to the vision of how we can solve uh, the crisis. Then the, the, the large middle section of the book takes each one of the solutions individually. And I've picked the, the, all of the ones that are really important uh, as part of a comprehensive plan. So the book has a chapter on solar energy, on wind power, on geothermal and enhanced geothermal power, biomass, carbon capture and sequestration, uh, nuclear power, and, and others. And it has a chapter on the supergrid. And, and perhaps most importantly, in some ways, a chapter on efficiency, because efficiency gains have long been recognized as the largest and best source of new energy supplies and reductions uh, in global warming pollution. And it's, let me just dilate on that just for a moment. Because in addition to staying with these old fuels that we've been uh, uh, habituated to, we have also clung to a, a, a set of old technologies that are more than 100 years old. The internal combustion engine, the coal-fired generating plant, and there's a long list of them. And now, in the 21st century, we have the ability to build far more efficient substitutes that don't waste so much energy. We actually waste most of the energy that we think we're using. Half of our electricity comes from those coal-fired generating plants. How much of the energy in that coal is, 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 is pulled out in the form of usable electricity? About one-third. And for the older, the most inefficient plants, down to, to 30%, absolutely. So 65 to 70 percent is just completely wasted, largely in the form of waste heat that could be recaptured and used. But the tangle of laws and utility regulations and the perverse incentives that flow out of those laws and regulations make it more profitable to just waste two-thirds of the energy rather than lifting a finger to actually capture it. And there are lots and lots of other examples. The internal combustion engine I mentioned. How much of the energy in the gasoline, this is a mistake to ask questions of an audience here in Cambridge because. <laughs> okay, sock it to me. How much of the energy in the gasoline is actually used to move the car from point A to point B? 10%. 90% of the energy in the gasoline, again, is just completely wasted. And my friend Amory Lovins takes that analysis further and calculates how much of the energy in the gasoline is used to move the person in the car <laughs> from point A to point B. And this is all, this is all in the book. There's a whole diagram, uh, illustration on this. About eight-tenths of one percent of the energy in the gasoline is used for the purpose <laughs> that we're 
that we think we're serving by, by driving the car. So part of the reason for the shift to electric vehicles is that electric vehicles are infinitely more efficient and again, when connected to renewable sources of electricity, really back out lots of carbon, reduce uh, a great deal of our dependence on foreign oil, and put people to work in, in the process. The third section of the book focuses on the obstacles that have to be removed in order to implement the solutions to the crisis. And so there is a, a chapter on the political obstacles. Again, go to repoweramerica.org. Uh, and uh, the political obstacles are formidable. The Center for Investigative Reporting just this past week put out a massive study, a report that represented their work on every continent over an extended period of time with a large number of investigators in which they document thoroughly and in detail the massive political campaign organized in the main by these uh, carbon polluters and others who have uh, an interest in blocking this transformation in every country on Earth. This is a global struggle. Now, happily, it is also the, 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 the cause that has brought out the largest grassroots movement in the history of the world. Paul Hawken, in his excellent book, Blessed Unrest, uh, analyzed these grassroots organizations and found that more than one million new NGOs focused on solving the environmental crisis have emerged just in the last few years globally, maybe as many as two million, according to his calculations. And again, they all live on, on the internet. This is an empowering tool. I urge you to make use of it. I urge you to make use of every tool that you can uh, make use of to persuade your members of Congress, uh, your senators, and, and your local and state leaders to take action and to be a part of the solution to this. So a second obstacle is, the, is the, the current pattern of economic accounting and, and the set of incentives in the marketplace that do not capture all of the values that they should be measuring and taking into account. CO2, for example, is invisible, tasteless, and odorless. But more important than that, it has no price tag. And so the old cliche, out of sight, out of mind, certainly applies to CO2. If we are so committed to the market system, and it, it works extremely well, but if we're that committed to it, we ought to make sure that it's, that it's working properly and that it's not distorted as it presently is. You're familiar with the old uh, buzzword externalities that the economists uh, throw around. Basically, it refers to uh, something that you want to pretend doesn't exist. And pollution has long been in that category. And every time we as Americans have stood up to say, don't put the pollution in the water, don't put the pollution in these pits in the ground. Don't foul the air to where we can't breathe it in, in a healthy way. Every time we have tried to cut back on pollution, the people responsible for the pollution have thrown up all these classic objections. Oh, we can't do that. And they'll give all their reasons. But when we press forward and assert the public interest, then we can succeed. Back when I was working on uh, nuclear arms control years ago, the military strategists and historians taught me that the military uh, analysts look at conflicts in roughly three categories, local battles, theater or regional wars, and the rare but all-important global 
or world wars, strategic conflicts. These environmental fights that we've had for a long time also fall into the same three categories. And the most common has to do with local forms of pollution. And then there are regional uh, forms of pollution, like acid rain, for example, originating in the Midwest and settling out uh, in the Northeast. Uh, and there are examples of that all over the world. The, the, uh, the poisons and the chemicals that come out the Mississippi River and create these dead zones in the Gulf of Mexico and all over the world, the number of dead zones in the ocean uh, are, is, is, is growing. But this issue is the rare but all important strategic environmental threat, global in nature. And we have to scale up our response accordingly. Again, those military theorists understand that the tactics, the strategy, the, the resources, uh, all have to change depending upon whether it's local, theater, or, or, or strategic. And here we have a global or strategic environmental threat that has, that's being waged largely as if it was a local a collection of local battles. And, and again, it's important to change the light bulbs and the windows. But this book is really not about the individual personal things that we do in our own lives and our homes and our businesses and places of worship and, 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 and communities. Uh, there is a little bit of that, but it is focused almost entirely on the policy changes on the legal changes, on the treaty that, that we need, on the large shifts that are necessary if we are going to solve this crisis. Yet another obstacle in that third section of the book focuses on changes in our thinking. This was one of the most interesting uh, parts of the book for me to research. I spent two full days with uh, the leading neuroscientists uh, and the leading behavioral psychologists. Had to have them on separate days. They don't necessarily get along. <laughs> they, uh, that's another story, too. But, but, they, but, but, but both disciplines have powerful insights to bring to this effort to solve the climate crisis. And again, without going into detail, just to briefly summarize, our ancestors survived specific threats over a long period of time. Not to get controversial here. Uh, <laughs> we had a trial in my home state, and um, <laughs> interesting, the Chamber of Commerce called for another Scopes trial on, on climate. I think they regret having used that phrase, but I hope they do. But anyway. Um, the threats that our ancestors survived put a premium on a particular kind of thinking. And they passed those traits on down to us. And even though our world is completely different from theirs, and we're most unlikely to encounter a leopard as we leave uh, the, the church here, nevertheless, we're still hardwired to respond to, to a threat of that kind. Short-term thinking is more the norm. But we do have the capacity for long-term thinking and the pursuit of long-term goals based on our deepest values. We have that capacity. And that chapter in, in the book describes all of the insights that these uh, experts have, have come up with. And they're fascinating to me, and I hope they are to you, but there are specific implications for how we can go about that. You know, the great cathedrals of Europe were built by multiple generations who stayed on task for many decades because when they set out on that course, the goal was based on very deeply felt and deeply shared values that were important enough to them to stay on course. Well, there's a particular part of the brain that's in charge of just that. 
and, the, and there are ways that we can communicate with one another that reinforce that. Now, in conclusion, um, if we were to decide in the present generation, for whatever reason, that it was fine for us to take advantage of all of the work and sacrifices by previous generations who left for us the accumulated majesty and wealth of a civilization that has brought much comfort and happiness to our lives and then exploit it fully and completely in our own time and give the back of our hand to all generations after us, that would be the single most immoral act by any generation of human beings ever to live on this planet. But that's what the stakes are. That's the decision we face. That's our choice. Because in order to implement a serious and effective plan to solve the climate crisis, and discharge our obligation to our children and those who come after us, we really have to make a choice. How, I see a lot of young people here. How many here in the last three years or so have decided to change your course of study or to embark on uh, uh, in an effort to try to get knowledge that will allow you to be a part of the solution for the climate crisis. Could I s see a show of hands? That's great. Th thank you. I, I, I remember. All those hands represent a great source of hope. I remember when I was 13 years old, President John F. Kennedy, who represented this district in the House of Representatives before he was president, issued a challenge to put a person on the moon and bring him back safely within 10 years. And I remember how many skeptics there were who said, that can't be done. But eight years and two months later, Neil Armstrong set foot on the moon. And on that day, there was a great cheer in mission control in Houston, Texas. And the average age of the systems engineers there was 26, which means their average age when they heard that challenge was 18. So those of you who raised your hands, set a goal rooted in your deepest values, know how high the stakes are and how much we're counting on you. But the rest of us have to understand how much they're counting on us. The time is nigh. Our choice lies before us. There's an old African proverb that I quote in the book. It says, if you want to go quickly, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. We have to go far quickly. which means we've got to get our act together quickly, <laughs> globally. We have to make our choice. Not too long from now, there will be an encounter when the next generation looks around them and the world left to them. And depending upon their circumstances, they'll look back at us and ask one of two questions. If they see the entire North Polar ice cap gone and Greenland and West Antarctica in a state of melting and collapse, if they see the deeper droughts and the stronger storms and all of the rest of the horrors the scientists have long been warning us about if we don't take this in hand, they would be more than justified in looking back at us and asking, what were you thinking? Didn't you hear the scientists? Didn't you pay attention to them? Were you watching uh, Dancing with the Stars? What in the world <laughs> was going on? Or didn't you care? If that's the question 
they ask. It will have profound implications for what it means to be a human being. If we consciously or unconsciously make a choice to condemn future generations to steadily degrading prospects, with each successive gener generation faced with the terrible realization that it's going to continue to get worse, that would really say something about who we are. I don't think that's who we are. I don't believe it for one minute. But I, if I could, if I could find the words, and I've tried in this book to transfer from my heart to yours, not only the knowledge that these experts have been generous in giving, but the passion that we've got to find a way to unlock in this generation, those of us alive today, there's a second question that next generation could ask. If they look around and see a world in renewal with lots of good jobs being constantly created as we make our civilization far more efficient and humane, if they are about the task of in improving the world on all of these multiple fronts as they continue to solve the climate crisis, then I want them to look back and ask of us, how did you find the moral courage to shake off that lethargy? How did you find the passion? How did you find the depth of commitment to rise up and solve a crisis that so many said was impossible to solve? That's the question I want them to ask. And our answer has to be in deeds, beginning now. These are the tools. We've got everything we need, with the potential exception of sufficient political will. But as our country and as this community has demonstrated over and over again, in the United States of America, political will is a renewable resource. Thank you very much for coming. I appreciate it very much.